films and our interesting guests, Rafael Zafko and Mikel Struve, to today's event at the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is called Fake News and Disinformation Against Political Dissident in the EU, the cases of Poland, Hungary, and Spain. Today, we have not only participants in the Zoom room, but also viewers via YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us today. The content of these presentations and the debate with questions and answers will be collected in a set of recommendations that we will deliver to the EU Commission. In order to let you know that, take care of the kind of speech you take after this in the debate. First, Please allow me to give a brief introduction to today's topic and introduce both speakers. The use of fake news and disinformation by state authorities against democratic movements in the EU to deny them legitimacy and even criminalize them is on the rise. This is an alarming trend to the extent that it contributes to the erosion of the quality of democracy in Europe and paves the way for the rise of hate speech. Within this framework, the Catalan National Assembly, a civil society organization from Catalonia, is holding this session today in the framework of the Conference for the Future of Europe of the European Commission, which will focus on addressing the cases of Hungary, Poland, and Spain. The goal of the session is to address the multiple social and political aspects of these trends, EU treaty responsibilities of member states and EU authorities concerning these cases and overall to discuss possible measures and tools to enhance democracy and free public debate on topics related to civil and political rights throughout Europe. We have two guests together with us this evening, which I want to introduce. Rafael Zvavko received his PhD in human rights, focusing on migration and diaspora from the University of Deusto. Rafael is also a freelance journalist with 10 years of experience specializing in the intersection of tech and politics, human rights development, as well as international politics, human rights, racism, racism feminism, Spanish and Brazilian politics, international conflicts and minority issues. He also writes about culture, particularly Latin culture, music, cinema and TV, and about environmental issues. He has published in major news outlets such as Al Jazeera, WIRED, MIT Tech Review, BBC, Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, etc. Mikel, our second guest tonight, is a member of the Lingua Pax board and he took a BA in Psychology and Physiology at the University of Oxford and a Master of Science in Psychology of Education at the London University, and also a degree in Psychology at the Univers Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. He worked mainly as a language planner in the field of promotion of Catalan for the Catalan government, and as a professor and researcher at the Open University of Catalonia. He is the author of a well-documented 273-page book, Lying for Unity, how Spain uses fake news and disinformation to block Catalonia's independence. He shows us his book <laughs> where he argues that the Catalan independence movement has been attacked by the Spanish authorities using, among other strategies, disinformation, manipulation, and accusations of indoctrination. It exposes the insistent attempts by the Spanish authorities to engage in large scale, disinform scale disinformation as one of its strategies, along with endless threats and lawfare to try to discredit, decapitate, and counter what is in fact an entirely peaceful democratic movement. After this brief introduction of our distinguished guests, we now come to the central part of our event. Here, both guests will first make a statement on one of the topics we have suggested and then answer to questions from us. Afterwards, we will offer the audience the opportunity to ask questions via the chat function on YouTube or Facebook, as well as give the floor to the audience present here in the Zoom room for any questions it may have. So we would like to start with Rafael. 
Rafael is gonna talk to us about the rise of fake news and disinformation campaigns by public authorities and pro-governmental -govern media in Poland and Hungary against democratic movements and opposition to what extent it poses a threat to democracy and paves the way for the rise of authoritarianism reactions from the EU authorities in this regard. So, Rafael, I would say the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara. Moltes uh, gracias a la Asamblea Catalana Nacional Catalana per la invitación. Thank you to the Asamblea Nacional Catalana for the invitation to this event. Uh, it's quite an interesting and relevant topic, definitely. Uh, we're with, what we're witnessing now in Catalonia is just a sample of the growing process of authoritarianism and police state that has been going on in Poland and Hungary and obviously other countries around the world for several years now. Not that the, not that the situation, for instance, in the Basque country for many years wasn't quite similar. We had newspapers closed, political parties banned, political leaders sent to jail. And I remember in a previous uh, event that I, I had the pleasure also to debate with Mikel for the Foreign Friends of Catalonia, that I, I reminded that the situation of Catalonia is still quite far from what the Basques have faced for many years. So, and by that, I mean, there's still a lot of room for, for the situation to get way worse for Catalans. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be discussed, a lot to worry and a lot to be done in order for the situation of Catalonia not to go as bad as was in the Basque country for several years. And uh, the Catalans, Catalonia situation obviously is terrible, what's going on now with political prisoners, with the persecution of activists, uh, with threats of parties being banned. There were th talks about the, the, the coup be banned uh, a couple of months or years ago. Also the persecution of several activists all over Catalonia and even outside uh, arrest orders against Puigdemont and other political uh, leaders in, of Catalonia, etc. But uh, Spain still has a lot to learn, if we can put it this way, from Poland and Hungary, from what they have been doing for, for several years now, both with the, uh, the Law and Justice Party in, in Poland and Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. So focusing specifically on media, disinformation and fake news in Hungary and Poland, uh, we can say that the phenomenon of fake news and disinformation is obviously not new, uh, nor the fact that governments and journalists and also newspapers aligned to such governments and to political parties make use of fake news, of disinformation, of news that uh, sometimes appear to be, to be real or have some grain of truth they are manipulated to attack opposition, individuals, opposition parties, and obviously for these uh, individuals to stay in power. Uh, Trump in the US, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Lukashenko in Belarus, and of course, Andrzej Duda and his law and justice party in Poland, and as I've mentioned, Viktor Orban in Hungary, are the first examples that often come to mind. But obviously they are not alone. You have all the several examples, uh, both from the right, from the left, you have examples in Europe, in Latin America, Africa, Asia, pretty much every continent, you have examples of political parties and leaders in power and sometimes also in opposition using fake news to advance their agendas, advance their, their narratives. So uh, there's an, an interesting uh, question on, on is an interesting point on the question, on the question that uh, what is, what comes first, uh, authoritarian regimes or fake news? And sometimes we end up falling a bit on, the, on the, the idea of egg and the chicken, who came first. So we can actually deal with uh, both issues together. Fake news, authoritarianism, they come together, they walk hand by hand. Uh, authoritarian leaders and wannabe authoritarian leaders, those who are just still trying to, to get there, they tend to heavily use fake news as a resource, almost as a governing tool, not only for internal audiences, but often to... Uh, deceive external audiences and organization. And to that extent, I would say that the Spanish government is so far a master to use fake news to deceive uh, the European Union and uh, several other countries in Europe to what they have actually been doing in Catalonia and what they have done in the Basque country. So what these authoritarian leaders, they often hope to achieve is not exactly for even the population to believe in the fake news, although they, they often do, but at least to create doubts, to cast doubt on what is actually the truth. 
and often to buy some time for them to promote the initiatives before a new position can arise. And also, obviously, to create a greater challenge for the media, the independent media, to report events correctly and to convince the population that what they're reporting is actually the truth, or at least uh, something more similar or more closer to the truth than what the governments are trying to, to sell. Uh, in Poland, media audiences are often exposed to internationally well-recognized conspiracies, like the anti-vax movement or the chemtrails, uh, the chemtrail conspiracies. Uh, and this is often something tailored to prevent the population from actually discussing relevant topics for themselves and for the country. This is something that often happens in Brazil. There are a lot of, uh, of fake news with anti-vax, chemtrails, uh, flat earthers, and conspiracy that communists are about to take over the country, etc., as a way to uh, keep the public discussing nonsense instead of actually discussing what is relevant, how the Bolsonaro is trying to, to promote a coup in Brazil, overthrow institutions, the Supreme Court, and etc. And this is something that takes place also in Poland. Uh, the ruling party, the law and justice, they have taken over the public broadcaster, the main TV channel. Uh, and they have created pretty much uh, uh, a safe space for fake news and for official information of, of the government, of the political party that's running the government nowadays. And they have cracking down on media freedom in the country. And one of the greatest dangers when you rig political, the political public channels, in the case, the Polish political public channel, is that the gen in general, the viewing population, does, they don't immediately notice the editorial change. It's something that a lot of people in Spain also have been complaining with the, the public Spanish television that have been changing the, the editorial line bit by bit. And it's there's a big habit factor involved when we talk about media, our official ch media channels, that uh, fake news and misleading news are more easily digested by the population when they follow this often habitual channels, the, the channels they have the habit to watch. So uh, it's easier for the government, for those who have these authoritarian wishes and et cetera, to impose their own agenda, their own narrative. And the ruling party in Poland has a clear anti-EU position. They are clearly xenophobic, populist, often homophobic, and also the government constantly launches smear campaigns against opponents, sometimes using official channels or using aligned newspapers and aligned journalists. Uh, authoritarian leaders like Duda, like Orban, Trump, or Bolsonaro, they tend to use the media as a theater, as a stage to gain the attention of the, of the population. The idea is to make a spectacle. So the content of the speeches, they often don't matter as much as the image and as the performance. So it doesn't matter if at one day um, Orban or Bolsonaro or Duda or Duterte, they said something and the other day, two days later, they say something completely different. What it matters is that they have the media attention. They are reaching a vast audience. And at the same time, they are humanizing themselves. They are, they are trying to pose as human leaders that are Democrats, that are every day on television speaking to the population. They're explaining themselves even sometimes justifying and even saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Like the Polish President Duda, for instance, is often homophobic, but recently he gave a speech calling for tolerance. So it doesn't really matter. It's, it's more like, oh, he's, he's saying that he's tolerant. He's saying that he needs people to be tolerant. This is for an outside audience. Like he's softening his speech, but inside his policies haven't changed. And this is quite important. Bolsonaro, for instance, in Brazil often does the same. One day he says he's against vaccination. The other day he says he's buying vaccines. And then again, I'm not going to get vaccinated myself, but if you want, go ahead. So this is a way to talk to the people, to show themselves as like a people person. I'm, I'm, I'm being accountable. Um, so in fact, once you have the control over the media, which is the main goal of social authoritarian leaders, you can attack your opponents and disguise your actions. And also you can just show the opposition as if they were not patriotic enough, they're agents of a third country, they are not doing enough to help the country, they are just trying to change the discourse, what is important for the country right now, what they're saying is not as important as what the government is saying. Trump was a master in use this, 
this kind of disguise, always saying that the Democrats are not worried enough with the country. Uh, what they're saying is not exactly what the people want to hear, what is important for the people. This is also typical of authoritarian leaders. In a sense, that's what happens a lot in Spain when uh, the current government says that the Catalan issue is not so important and what the Catalans are trying to do is just to make people worry about issues that are not exactly what the Spanish people need and want. And so we see there is a lot of fluidity between these discourses amongst authoritarian leaders and governments. And uh, again, in Poland, uh, the government has been using the media to justify actions such as the control of the judiciary system. Uh, in case of Hungary, to justify the expulsion of the Central European University using old anti-Semitic tropes against George Soros, which is one of the biggest finances of, of the Central European University. The same discourse also happens in Brazil against Soros. For instance, the support, Bolsonaro supporters always talk, to talk uh, about how Soros is horrible, how he supports international NGOs against the interests of the country. So it's an idea of also always using an external agent, an agent with money, with power that is trying to overthrow the government and doesn't understand the needs of the population. And once you convince the population, you can grab even more power, weakening institutions and centralizing all the decisions into one hand or the hands of the party, of a political party or political movement. So those leaders, they often focus in one or a set of enemies, justify their actions and their power grab. In Hungary, they often target Soros, they target uh, asylum seekers that they are against the wishes of the population of Hungary. They are gonna uh, create problems for the, within this idea of, of, of the Hungarian people because they're outsiders, they don't understand our culture which is also typical from every far right uh, leader nowadays that we have in Europe and all over the world. And also to say that uh, the opposition doesn't know how to deal with the problem. Yeah, as if uh, migrants and asylum seekers were a problem and etc. Orban goes even further, uh, creating bogus opposition parties just to divide them, just to divide the opposition and to secure the victory. And for instance, the 2018 national elections, uh, international monitors concluded that opposition efforts to the real chance because every news, major news outlet was controlled by the government. So they basically had no penetration whatsoever. Something that is starting to turn, uh, the mayor of Budapest is an opposition, is it's an, op an opponent to, to Orban and they are really trying to uh, change things a bit in, in, in Hungary, although it's quite still difficult. So this shows that once you control the media, you don't even have to rig the elections. You can manipulate the public enough so that they will vote the way you want, to, want them to vote. And that's why discussing fake news is so important. So we, today we call it fake news, but we have this information for ages, for dozens of years. Fake news is just a new, the new way that we put it because we have Facebook, we have Twitter, so we have an a, a easier way maybe to manipulate than we had before but manipulation is pretty much still the same. So once you control the media and you feed the public with fake news, with this information, you can easily control the narrative. So in, for instance, Orban, he packed the judiciary with, with his loyalists, just like Poland is doing now. He redrew the electoral map, changed the electoral laws. He gave ethnic Hungarians who never set foot on the country the right to vote. He gutted the civil services, appointed loyalists in watchdog agencies and amended the constitution. So in sum, he did everything he could to take complete control of the country. And in both cases, the EU launched condemnatory messages against Poland and against Hungary, has taken legal action against the countries. Uh, the EU commission recently started legal action against Hungary and Poland for violating fundamental rights of the LGBT population. European Court, the European Union Court of Justice rule against Poland and Poland defied the rule. And the European presented a second report on the state of the rule of law in the EU, I guess was in last July, also uh, uh, mentioning that both Poland and Hungary are highly problematic. And among other things, they demand judicial reforms in both countries, decisive actions against combat, uh, to combat corruption, against corruption, and to uh, reinforced democracy and democratic institutions. And in most cases, it fell in deaf ears, deaf ears. 
So uh, the EU legal actions and condemnations have led both Poland and Hungary to threaten to leave the EU. And both countries have decided mostly just to ignore the EU. But what is interesting in both cases is that the EU took measures to at least say, okay, this is not good, what you're doing is not okay, you have to make reforms. They, they, they set in motion measures, uh, they are threatening to cut funds, EU funds to both countries and etc. But when it comes, <coughs> I'm sorry, to Spain, the European Union hasn't haven't done pretty much anything. It's just some scattered decisions in, in, in courts, but mostly set in motion by Catalan activists, or in many cases by Basque activists in the past. As for instance, I've mentioned when I started speaking that we had newspapers closed in Spain. It was the Aguine de Goncaria. And just a few years ago, maybe last year, I don't remember quite exactly, maybe one, two years ago, an European court said that the closure of newspapers was unlawful. But in the meantime, the newspapers were shut down. Journalists were sent to jail. Marcelo Tamendi, who was the editor of one of the newspapers, was brutally tortured by the, by the police, uh, the police, the Spanish police. So it was just many, many years later. The same case of when uh, the leaders of Bateragune, the political party that was being built by Arnaldo Otegi and other leaders of the Basque left, they were sent to jail and they spent, I guess, five or six years in jail. And then again, the European court said, okay, that was unlawful. So just after the fact, it's quite ineffective. And normally Spain doesn't really care. Uh, Spain has been convicted several times for not investigating torture, for torturing citizens, bus citizens, and etc. and nothing has changed. And uh, what, what's probably going to happen now is that in the Catalan case, there are several lawsuits in motion in European, in European courts. And after something major happens, the de decision will come and say, okay, Spain, you, you did it and you shouldn't have done it, but it won't make much difference. So obviously what Catalonia needs is a more firm decision, more firm stances, needs all the countries to jump in and discuss the situation and call, it, call Spain to you know, uh, ch really profoundly change the way the judiciary works, which is completely politicized and not uh, independent and how they are doing politics and discussing the Catalan issue. That I believe Mikel now will, will speak with much more uh, arguments and callers about uh, how Spain is heading to the similar situation of Hungary and Poland and all the authoritarian countries. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you very much for these interesting remarks. And I was just making some um, notes and um, it was scaring to me when I heard you say that the, author the authoritarian regimes uh, tried to create a safe, safe space for fake news. It's like a kind of oxymoron when you talk about <laughs> safe space and fake news. Um, we will certainly come back to later in the uh, debate. I would now, thank you, and I would like to ask Mikkel to take uh, the floor and to relate on the use of fake news and disinformation by the Spanish authorities and media against Catalonia, which is also the topic of his a book we already have been talking about. So the floor is yours, Mikkel. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you for inviting me. I'm pleased to renew my uh, longstanding uh, attachment to the Assemblea, which in fact started before it was formally founded. And um, I've been a... Um, uh, a follower of many of its activities, including those huge annual demonstrations, which I think are obviously not, not strictly political in, in, in electoral terms, but I think have made a, a very big impact on, in, in visual terms uh, on public opinion in many countries. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I think fake news falls into one of two kinds of group or, or, um, uh, or group would do, either misinformation or disinformation. Um, misinformation, which we're not talking about today, is inaccurate information. So the person or the medium 
disseminating, it may not actually be aware that uh, this information is inaccurate. And on the other hand, what is called disinformation, in which deliberate falsehoods may be disseminated even by reputable media. In both cases, sometimes these media correct themselves when the error is pointed out, but by no means always, as maybe we shall see. Um, as Rafael said quite rightly, uh, fake news has been going around a long time. Uh, and for, let's say, colonial uh, ends as well, the, the Vikings in the probably ninth or 10th century, when they discovered Iceland, they, which had no name, of course, they, when they came back home, they said, oh, we found a big island. You must go and colonize it. it it's called Iceland. But I don't think their efforts were very successful. So when they, um, a few years later, discovered what they called Greenland, why did they call it green when there's less green in Greenland than anywhere in the world, except for the large desert? Well, I, I think the reason is that that was uh, a propaganda campaign. It was an attempt to get um, Vikings, Scandinavians to colonize what they were promised was um, a green land. So these things have been going on for a very long time. So disinformation is, as I say, deliberate lying, the deliberate use of false information in order to achieve one of, of several goals, a number of goals. I mean, they may be commercial, they may be political, they may be social. In this particular session, I think we're going to deal with the goal of trying to suppress dissent by trying to attack political opponents with fake news. In this context, um, this is one of the various strategies that can be devised to attack dissenters. Another is the use of lawfare that has already been mentioned, the twisting of the law that we've seen so much of in South America, um, recently in Myanmar and many other countries, as Rafael outlined very, very correctly, to remove politicians from power. We're not going to discuss lawfare principally today beyond observing that it is at least less dramatic than the often used physical liquidation of opponents, which is becoming less popular, let's put it that way. Note though that while disinformation may be aimed at general public opinion to criminalize one's chosen victim or victims, the effect on judges, prosecutors, and even defense counsel of fake news may be highly damaging. After all, they're humans, um, unless it's revealed for what it is. And it may well influence such people and affect judges' verdicts in trials, especially if the alleged crimes uh, have uh, purportedly been committed hundreds of kilometers from the capital where the most influential national and international media tend to be concentrated. I think most of us will agree that uh, it was Mr. Trump's first presidential campaign that put fake news in these terms in the forefront of the political scene. We discovered, wow, thousands of kidnapped children in the sewers of New York. We found Mrs. Clinton engaging in multiple criminal offenses. And then of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic split the world in two. Those who did or did not believe it was a deliberate plan uh, by the um, elite to cut the world's population with what turned out not to be, um, well, far less, far less deadly virus than its immediate precedent. So a fairly ineffectual attempt at that. But I'm here mainly to talk about Spain. And without a doubt, Catalonia has allowed the use of fake news mainly by the Spanish media, and not only those based in Madrid, to make the headlines in the context of the Catalan's claim to nationhood following the partial striking down by Spain's constitutional court of Catalonia's revised regional constitution, which is known as a statute of autonomy. Uh, this law was drafted by the Catalan parliament, adopted by the Spanish parliament with many amendments reducing its content, and significantly ratified by the Catalan people in a, by definition, binding referendum. All of this was laid down in the constitution. All the steps were taken really strictly according to the 
Spanish constitution, and then the Spanish constitutional court, which is, um, well, I'll leave adjectives out, um, decided that uh, part of what had even been ratified by a binding referendum were, was, um, was not constitutional. So as from 2010 then, the date of this ruling, which was at the behest of the main right-wing party, the nationalist Partido Popular, the Catalan nationalist parties, I use the term with some trepidation as it means very different things in different countries. In Catalonia, a land where over half of the adult population, that is the electoral census, have not a single Catalan born grandparent in Catalonia, uh, these are inclusive parties. So as I was saying, the Catalan nationalist parties move steadily towards breaking away from Spain in order to be able to legislate locally instead of largely having to rely on the always fickle parliamentary majorities in the Spanish parliament. Before explaining some good examples, to my mind, of um, fake news, allow me to point out something that is very significant in Spain. The Catalans particularly, but also the Basques, are the victims of deeply ingrained prejudice and negative attitudes, particularly at the collective level. All Catalans have gone to Madrid, chatted with people, and get in reply, oh, for a Catalan, you're, you're very simpatico, you're a very, very nice person, uh, surprised. Um, Catalans are widely described as selfish, stingy, inward looking, which is enough to rule them out, though to be fair, they're also seen as industrious, reliable, and relatively well educated. Um, the stereotype for many is remarkably similar to that of the Jews. This means that any anti-Catalan campaign is likely to be successful in Spain, including winning votes, mainly outside Catalonia, of course. It helps explain why the public prosecutor in the south of Spain, that's Andalusia, did not press charges against the town of Coripe in 2019. And I quote Catalonia president, uh, Catalonia's president Puigdemont's comment, today in a town in Spain governed by the Socialist Party, they decided to shoot at and burn a doll that looked like me and that wore a visible yellow ribbon as he did. Shooting at and burning a rag doll representing a despicable person is apparently an annual tradition in this village uh, every Easter. They burn a Judas. So against the, this back, backdrop began a series of false claims against Catalan politicians. Former President Pujol was accused of having money in Liechtenstein, as was Barcelona's mayor, Dr. Xavier Trias, and President Artur Mas. Some of these accusations were accompanied by faked images of account numbers and appeared in the anti-Catalan press. I can only describe it that way. Libertad Digital, OK Diario, El Mundo, and others. Um, and some of these accusations were suspiciously close to particular elections. And it's likely that Dr. Trias lo lost his own re-election on this account. False police reports, at least no one acknowledged their authorship, uh, started being leaked for the purpose of incriminating Catalan politicians. No judges, no prosecutors came to any conclusion on the uh, authors or the legality of such leaks. Another example of fake news is Operation Judas, the name given by the Civil Guard under the instruction of the Spanish National High Court to an early morning operation on September the 23rd, two years ago, just weeks before the Supreme Court verdict that condemned nine leading politicians and, socialist and um, social activists to long jail sentences, in which nine people also linked to the so-called defense committees of the Republic, the Catalan Republic, uh, were arrested, whisked away to Madrid, and accused of terrorism. All the Spanish media led with this news. It seemed that several of them make fireworks for one of the traditional Catalan 
cultural groups they call diablos, the devils, that spray watches on and dances with sparks during uh, Pasacalle or nighttime parades. Spanish police claimed to, to have found precursors of explosives. They spent several months in detention in the Madrid jail before being released by the judge pending trial on the grounds that the evidence was flimsy and several of the precursors are simply household products you can buy in any supermarket. But this is a good point to underline the desperate need for the Spanish authorities to be able to regard the independence movement as violent. Um, this would allow them to accuse Catalans of rebellion, of an armed uprising, or of terrorism. But uh, the Catalan movement has made nonviolence one of its cornerstones, and Spain could not intervene in the same way as in the Basque country, as Rafael mentioned, where violence was manifest on both sides, allow me to add. So fake news reached a frenzy when the Catalan party uh, parliament adopted bills for a binding self-determination referendum in 2017, something the Spanish authorities had turned down over 15 times, despite article one of the international covenant uh, on civil and political rights to which Spain adhered in 1977, which says very clearly all peoples have the right of self-determination. And by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political station, status and freely pursue their economic, cultural and social development. And in the same article, the state's party to the present covenant shall promote the realization of the right of self-determination and shall respect that right in conformity with the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations. Well, anyone uh, claiming that the Catalans are not a people in, in, within that uh, definition uh, will uh, come up with a lot of opposition in Catalonia. The second parliament, uh, second law adopted by the Catalan parliament on the establishment of the Catalan Republic um, uh, were the referendum to result in a majority of uh, in favor of independence, which it duly did by over 90% of voters. On that day, fake news flew in, in all directions. Uh, on voting day, as you may remember, Spanish police attacked thousands of people queuing up to vote at their polling stations in attempts to seize the ballot boxes, which they had vainly searched for for several weeks, and the ballots. The amount of field evidence is colossal. Yet Spanish ministers like uh, Dusty uh, actually told the BBC interviewer that the videos were mo mostly fake news or from incidents in other countries. The, the wide-eyed interviewer responded by pointing out that a BBC crew had actually witnessed and filmed one of these attacks. There were later denials that people had been injured, uh, though a thorough analysis of each medical report confirmed that over a thousand people had been hurt and quite a few in several parts of their bodies. Um, at, on that day, a Twitter account with a Spanish flag on it spread manipulated news about the death of a police officer from the Basque country who had supposedly been displaced to Barcelona um, where um, uh, items of fake news claimed that he had died of a heart attack. The truth is that the death of the officer was true, but it had occurred in Valladolid and not in Barcelona, if you know Spanish geography. Well, that's, that's about 800 kilometers away. And many other examples of fake news on Twitter with claims attacking the Spanish authorities turned out to be by account holders who had never tweeted before about Catalonia, had no involvement or attachment to the Catalan independence movement, and who instead seemed to want to attack the system for uh, whatever reason. And again, when President Puigdemont went to Brussels with uh, most of the members of his government before any warrant had been issued for his arrest and held a press conference there, he began being treated as fugado, as a fugitive. Whereas it was perfectly clear what his address was to become a few days later, and every time he'd been summoned or arrested by the authorities in Germany, in Belgium, 
in Italy just a few days ago. He's immediately responded. And the request for his extradition on grounds of rebellion and sedition have on every occasion been turned down. On each occasion, the Spanish nationalist press went wild with glee, only to be foiled by the outcome. My impression is that Spanish public opinion has been so poisoned by fake news and manipulation by the media that most Spaniards are simply incapable of coping with the cognitive dissonance between their beliefs and the facts. This is a serious state of affairs, and perhaps later in the session, Rafael or I will want to make a comment on this issue. The leaders of both main Spanish political parties have issued strongly worded statements saying that President Puigdemont has to return to Spain to face the courts, uh, the Supreme Court. But several European courts say it's not the right court to try him, even if some offenses can be claimed to have been committed. Um, if you agree, Barbara, you seem to be saying yes a lot, which I, I appreciate. Yes. Uh, I'll leave things here for the time being. Hopefully people following, following the session will be able to ask more questions later. Thank you very much, Mikael. Um, listening to you and listening to this uh, very clear examples you were uh, giving us, it uh, just suggested to me that uh, maybe if you work on fake news long enough about talking about violence, at the end there is a story, it's a kind of storytelling so that everyone is um, really thinking about this violence no one has seen until now. So this um, could be um, uh, um, a good summarize of uh, what you were talking about. Thank you very much, Mikael. Um, we would like to start now, or we would like to go on with a uh, uh, few questions we have been uh, preparing here. So Raphael, uh, first of all, because you really know about that, we would like to know from you um, which kind of perceptions of the Catalan question you have um, noticed that are really uh, arrived that really arrived in the Brussels bubble and in the EU media, and um, to what extent fake news and disinformation against Catalonia have resonated and are being taken somehow seriously in this context. This would be very interesting to us. Yeah, um, here, here in Brussels, in Belgium, uh, at us mostly with. A political, for instance, is one of the newspapers who, ha who has been covered covering the, the, the Catalan issue with, uh, I would say, mostly positive view over the Catalans, uh, the Catalan narrative, let's just put it this way, uh, normally covering what Puigdemont is doing, uh, the troubles of Spain, Spain trying to arrest him, etc. Uh, for what I've been talking to, I've been talking to other colleagues, journalists, not just here in Brussels, but all over the, the Europe, the US and Brazil. Uh, they, once they have an understanding of what is the real situation, they tend to side with, uh, with the Catalans. They tend to understand that what, what Spain is doing is a bit over, over the top, it's a bit too much. Uh, it's interesting that recently the New York Times actually adopted a quite Spanish position. Uh, I haven't really, I haven't really been able to understand why. Uh, I even wrote uh, a critical piece of, of, of what New York Times was doing uh, recently. Um, coming again with the idea of Russian invasion that the Russians are behind, which is actually an attempt of Spain to poison the discussions in Europe because everybody's afraid of Russia. So let's just use Russia as the example, the big scary, uh, post-communist, uh, whatever. So they are trying to use Russia to set forward the narrative that uh, Europe must take care, be careful, because uh, the Catalans are siding with Putin and siding with Russia, which is stupid. And I, I'm really not sure why the New York Times just sided with, with Spain on this narrative, but for what I've been reading here in Europe, most uh, news pieces about Catalonia, about Spain, they tend to be more balanced and really give the perspective 
that uh, obviously Catalans have some right to decide, they have the right to freedom of expression, what is going on with uh, the Catalan political prisoners is obviously an absurd, May, even if they don't, necess they don't necessarily agree with the idea of independence, but obviously they, they, they tend to be more sympathetic to the side of those who are being oppressed by Spain right now. Okay, that's um, interesting to know. Uh, no one of us will probably be able to explain um, why the New York Times uh, shifted um, to this Spanish position. But we wanted to ask you, Mikel, also um, to this uh, topic, this uh, claims of Russian involvement in the Catalan independence process. Um, why do you think that uh, the authorities and the Spanish media have fabricated this uh, case without uh, evidences um, and uh, without any clear idea what is uh, going on and which consequences can have this on the public opinion in Spain, for example? Barbara, as they say, I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, can I just underline something that Rafael has just said of course. With, with an example. Um, John Carlin, uh, a sports uh, reporter, um, had a column in El País for many years. Yes. He wrote a, a letter to the Times in which he says, he said, I would be extremely sorry if Catalonia left Spain. But I can understand it particularly by the way uh, Prime Minister Rajoy is uh, dealing or not dealing with what was a, a, an emerging conflict, political conflict. Well, he was sacked by El País for saying that. But he was not in favor of independence. As Rafael says, um, siding with uh, is, doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, are in favor of independence. I think that was important to underline. Um, Claims about the alleged Russian connections are scandalous, and I'll come back to a place now. They started in a big way just days before the referendum in, in September uh, 2017, uh, when El País and in particular David Alandete uh, began to publish uh, a theory uh, linking up Russians uh, with, um, with the Catalan uh, process. Uh, Julian Assange, who's hardly you know, a, a pro-Russian um, person. And Anthony Snowden, who um, maybe were accused of interfering in, in the Catalan process. Even the EU foreign minister, Josep Borrell, ironically uh, Catalan born, openly accused the Putin government of such involvement um, and was publicly snubbed by the Russian foreign minister, much to the delight of many Catalans. Uh, well, they made these claims, and an ad hoc committee in the UK Houses of Parliament actually invited Spanish representatives, which included Alandete, included people from the Real Instituto Juan Sebastián Elcano, which uh, presumably is funded by, uh, publicly, but is devoted to foreign policy issues. They were invited to London to explain the evidence they had to back up their claim. And they were humiliated by having to admit that they had no hard evidence at all. Uh, more recently, on, uh, still on the Russian side, the Spanish police has confiscated a number of cattle and businessmen, and built up a tale, a narrative of political Russian connections with Puigdemont's uh, entourage. And this is called Operation Volkov. <laughs> For those, you know, we, our eyes just bulged out of our heads. For those unfamiliar with the World War II Eastern Front, Volkov was a city in the river where the Spanish Blue Division of so-called volunteers, well, many, many were volunteers, uh, fought on Hitler's side against our Russian allies. So uh, even the choice of the name of the operation was uh, very unfortunate, to put it mildly. Um, well, these people had their mobile phones um, confiscated and um, all their WhatsApp messages about everything, 
everything you could possibly imagine were put in, in into the mixer and out came a wonderful series of claims um, such as you know very serious claim by one of them that there were 10,000 uh, Russian soldiers waiting for orders to uh, support the uh, Catalan independence. Um, and they're, they're basically commercial ventures which are interpreted as secret ways of funding the independence uh, process. Well, all of this, I think Raphael more or less insinuated is, is a strategy to try and make sure the EU, which has set up bodies to verify affirmations of fact-checking bodies and to filter fake news, um, largely uh, because of um, insinuations or suspicions that Russia is indeed involved, uh, to make sure that the EU will not look kindly on Catalonia's claim to nationhood, the pursuit of which was, has always been, perhaps grudgingly, declared to be a legitimate aim by none other than Spain's Supreme Court. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mikael, for um, also these explanations about these um, examples that uh, show us how um, it is uh, working in Spain and how they are working on this um, problem. Um, we would like to know from both of you, so I would like to direct this next question to both of you, so um, that you can answer from your own perspective. Um, which kind of implications and consequences uh, this use of disinformation and fake news um, by the Spanish authorities and uh, the Spanish nationalist media against Catalonia um, can have for the uh, pro-Indie movement? So, and which, if you see an impact in terms of paving the way of the criminal for the cr criminalization of this uh, movement, the use of lawfare, the rise of hate speech. Do you think all these uh, topics are linked to each other? So there is a right strategy. And if you do so, um, do you think this will be, this will work? Is this really trying or achieving a kind of dehumanization of the Catalan people so that um, this, uh, the democratic values in Spain um, are resonating and maybe um, we have a change in the society and in the way of um, um, looking at this problem and this conflict with Catalan people and the pro indian movement. Maybe Rafael, you may start and then Mikel. Yeah, sure. Just uh, one brief comment about my previous comment is that yes. when I was talking, obviously, about the Brussels Bobo was more, I was mentioning the English uh, newspapers because the French or the Dutch press, they vary. Normally, in the case here of Belgium, if the media outlet is closer to the NVA, the New Vlaams Alliance, which is a political yeah. party who has actually taken a push them on. Uh, has helped him and everything to settle in, etc. The youths definitely see a more favorable position. And obviously, uh, it depends from, from media to media, but my focus was mostly uh, the English speaking, like politi political Brussels times and etc. Yeah. Uh, specifically about fake news and the criminalization, etc. As I've mentioned before, Mikkel as well, uh, there is an attempt to, to, to say that the Catalan, the Russia is behind everything that is going on in Catalonia. So as a way to, to scare uh, to scare the European public and institutions that if they support Catalonia, they will be supporting Russia. Uh, this is one, one clearer point of discussion, but obviously uh, media in, in Spain, they, they can claim responsibility if anything more violent takes place against Catalans because they have been pushing for tougher measures. Uh, they were acting as cheerleaders in in 2017, after the ref during after the referendum, and I was in Catalonia helping with the barricades and taking pictures. And following the meeting was just absolutely crazy. They were pretty much saying that violence was the answer in in, in Catalonia. And one thing that I, I find particularly worrisome is that when you read from El País, from Publico, uh, you go to to more far right newspapers. 
uh, everything about Catalonia seems to be the same. It doesn't matter if it's from a left-wing perspective or right-wing perspective. Obviously, there are exceptions, but uh, from all uh, political ideologies, you see the same take on what is going on in Catalonia. That is an absurd, that is unacceptable, that Catalans, they are fascists, they don't, uh, they don't support the idea of united EU because they want to split. And all this obviously is gonna create hatred towards Catalans because they are the ones trying to implode Spain. They're trying to destroy Spain. That's the same hatred that was directed towards Basques for many years. Whenever you spoke about, about the Basque country, the first thing that people remember was ETA, was terrorism. Even I remember when I was studying for my master's and my PhD that I, in both cases, I studied the Basque country, so the Basque uh, identity and Basque nationalism. Everybody, the first question everybody asked me was, oh, but it's not, isn't it dangerous? I mean, because they are all terrorists mm -hmm. and isn't terrorism what they do? And, and so, yeah, the media had a very important role in spreading this. I remember many, many years ago, I wrote a piece for, for a newspaper in Brazil, exactly talking about how every time there was anything about the Basque country, even when they're talking about music, culture, travel, uh, or culture or whatever, there was always a final line saying ETA has killed about 700 people in the Basque country. They had, they always had to talk about ETA, at least in Brazil, there was a reality. So you create a sense that every time that you, that everything that relates to these people, to this population relates also to terrorism, relates to split, relates to uh, uh, violence and etc. And that's what it's going on now in, in Catalonia. Every time you read something in a Spanish newspaper, is uh, it's in a derogatory way. Fortunately, at least when I'm reading newspapers in Brazil or reading English media, uh, reading newspapers from Germany and etc., mostly English-speaking media, you see some more balanced takes on what is going on in Catalonia. Not always, obviously, but at least Catalans have been quite successful in spreading their message particularly also because Spain alone can just implode its own efforts uh, with this international warrants against Puigdemont, against uh, uh, other political leaders and et cetera. All the violence that took place in 2017 ran the world. Everybody saw it. Uh, the scenes of old people being beaten by the police for just trying to vote. So Spain in itself alone is doing a great job of, of helping Catalans worldwide when it comes to the media. But obviously uh, this Russia, Russian link is just another attempt to scare the European population. And I'm pretty sure that they have other plans uh, to try to, to convince the international public that the Catalans are the wrong, I'm the wrong and they are, they are the ones who don't want to dialogue, to discuss anything and et cetera. And obviously this will in the long run, if, I mean, if Catalans are not as successful, successful as they are now to uh, oppose this narrative, I think that Spain will, will try to make things harder for, for Catalans and for the image of Catalonia all over the world. Okay, Miquel? Uh, I'm sure that uh, Spanish diplomacy has spent a great deal more than the six million odd euros that since 2011, you know, well before the, the fully fledged independence movement uh, reached uh, the political level, um, are being claimed by the court of auditors, which is not a court of law. Uh, a lot of them are political appointees. A lot of the staff are relatives of the political appointees. And they, uh, without granting any right to uh, defense, uh, decide who they're going to find for, for what um, misdemeanors. Uh, this is um, something I, I wanted to mention in, in this presentation. It's not strictly fake news, but all the evidence that they uh, have to try and um, uh, find Catalan leaders and, and uh, civil servants is, uh, very tenuous, to, to say the least. And you know, what can Catal Catalonia's foreign policy do? You know, um, will explain the situation to the world. And I've been uh, um, on a, a number of missions to do that. I've been invited to a number of sessions there. And there was always someone from 
the unionist, if we can call it that, opposition. So uh, I think all of this is unfounded, but it's part of the strategy, uh, as, as we were saying earlier, there's a, a very large strategy, which partly is based on uh, convincing local uh, public opinion in Spain that um, repressive measures are legitimate. And we keep insistently repeating this is a political conflict and a political solution is the only way to put an end to the conflict. But as each day goes by, there are new trials of you know, there are over 3,000 people either awaiting trial or, or have already been tried. So the, the, let's say the repression has not stopped however much the Spanish government wants to talk about um, uh, dialogue and, and looking for solutions. The first way would be to stop the repression. So influencing public opinion in Spain, I think, is the main uh, objective of the Spanish government. But they have spent a lot of money, nice, glossy publications explaining all the, um, all the falsehoods that the Catalan independence movement is uh, supposedly um, trying to disseminate. So they've been doing a lot of work there. They've tried to ban any number of um, university uh, conferences or seminars on the issue. So I would say that in Europe, as Rafael says, people are beginning to see through the, the facade of Spain. And of course, you have to remember that um, the uh, European Court of Human Rights is very slow and usually uh, acquits, it's not exactly the right word, uh, cancels the um, verdicts of Spanish courts, um, you know, a few weeks after the uh, person who spent years in prison has come out of prison. Um, but I think what is extremely important here is the fact that um, the European Parliament is now involved. The Euro European Parliament was um, tricked into waiving uh, the um, the um, immunity, parliamentary immunity, or at least part of it, uh, of three Catalan MEPs, including President Puigdemont. And uh, that has been taken to the European Court of Justice. And that is, uh, let's say, a more direct level of intervention. But uh, as I think we all three agree, uh, Spain doesn't really seem to, uh, at least purportedly, well, visibly, take any notice of anything that any European court says. So um, what the outcome will be is open to doubt. But as I say, on this occasion, it's the parliament itself <laughs> that, has, that has been accused of allowing um, Spanish manipulation of its M MEPs. Uh, that verdict will be extremely important and that's expected early next year. Thank you very much, uh, Mikael, for these uh, last remarks and comments on um, the court, on the EU court, because this was one of the questions uh, already arrived um, from the audience. We would now open the debate and start, uh, first of all, with questions maybe from our um, public from the public here at the zoom room i have seen there is someone who would like to say do you have an a question Pira jordi if you do Trial. So, could you please switch your camera on Trial. oh i think this doesn't work so then we can wait that but as well. Well. no this doesn't work so um uh, but as well, you can write your question into the chat um so we would uh, then go on with the first question we got over um via youtube or facebook so this is a question what is your opinion concerning the case of journalists that are recruited by state intelligence agencies? To what extent this trend chain challenges freedom of media? 
I think both of you can give an answer. Maybe we start with Raphael. Well, um, again, not a new phenomenon of journalists in newspapers uh, being on the pocket of governments of authoritarian leaders. That's absolutely not new. Although when we when we talk about Spain, I believe the situation is even a bit more complicated because most cases you don't even have to pay them to, to support the idea of a united Spain. <laughs> Actually, I was just I was just now remembering of a. Uh, one of famous declaration from Jose Calvo Sotelo, who was a uh, minister of uh, dictator Primo de Rivera, that he once, uh, almost a hundred years ago, he said, antes una España roja que una España rota. I prefer a red Spain rather than a, a broken Spain. And he said this in the in San Sebastián, in Donostia, in the fronton, I guess in early 1930s. And I believe that this phrase pretty much defines Spain. The idea that I don't care if there's a fascist dictatorship or a communist dictatorship or whatever kind of dictatorship you have. If Spain is together, that's what it, it works. And what we see uh, the Spanish government using this, this ideology against Basque activists, now using against Catalan activists. It was used during the Franco dictatorship, during the Primo de Rivera dictatorship. So I think that this defines Spain. And in a sense, uh, when we talk about Poland, we talk about Hungary, we talk about Brazil or many countries, you definitely have journalists on the pocket of, of, gov of, of uh, political leaders and etc. And in Spain, I think that they don't actually need it. You have this ideology in Spain of a united Spain, España una y grande, uh, one Spain, a huge Spain, that you, it's, it's, ide it's an ideology. It goes from left to right. Mm. Mikael, would you agree? I, I completely agree. Um, I think, well, obviously journalists are recruited to work for uh, government uh, departments or, or uh, parties. I mean, that is perfectly legitimate. But what, what was being asked was obviously uh, uh, secret recruitment to uh, influence their, the editorial line or, yes. or that their own position. Um, my impression is that, uh, whole newspapers, digital newspapers, have been set up uh, with the primary task of attacking Catalan um, independence and uh, oh. underlining uh, unity. Um, thinking, well, I mentioned several before, but OK, oh. OK Diario is a particularly um, good or bad, however you want to read it, example, and Libertad Digital uh, is also, I think both both of those uh, digital media um, would probably not be banned in Poland or Hungary, but I think they would not be allowed to um, disseminate their hate speech uh, in um, many Western uh, European democracies. Trial. Oh, then Jordi, could you switch please your Micro, oh, thank you. So, um, thank you, Mikael. This would be an interesting question if in other countries it would be allowed or if they would be really allowed to, um, to have this um, discursive hate speech every day, again and again, against um, Catalonia or another topic. So, um, we have this question you already started to um, answer about the upcoming EU court and Strasbourg human rights uh, court decisions. And the question would be if uh, you think that this upcoming decisions on the Catalan case may have an impact on the EU or mainly in the commission, in the EU commission stands on the conflict um, and uh, stands on the conflict Catalonia, Spain and Spanish repressive actions. Do you really think this will have consequences? Mikel already pointed out he doesn't think so. Rafael, do you really believe that these decisions will? No, I second Mikel. Uh, I don't think, I only, th I think that only uh, a strong action by the European Commission, by part countries, they are part of the EU, 
really pushing diplomatically for Spain to change its ways would make a difference. Or maybe obviously a, a decision of a high European court that would have real power to force Spain to comply. Although, as I've mentioned, uh, the European Union court has decided against uh, Poland and Poland just said, okay, I don't care. And so, or just decided make a few changes just to look good, but not necessarily change the core of, of the whole situation. So um, the threatening to leave the EU and et cetera. So I think that uh, the EU still has some very weak institutions when it comes to judiciary institution, when it comes to enforce decisions. Yeah. Uh, countries mostly, mostly accept a few of the decisions when they think that it's not really gonna impact on their whole policies. It's like the Spain accepting to pay some fines or whatever when the, the Human Rights Court decides that uh, one arrest was unlawful, there was torture or, or etc. It's more up to the countries to decide to comply or not. And we, the EU still lacks some, some more uh, strong and decisive instruments to make them comply. Although so far, the European Commission has remained silent on everything that is going on in Catalonia. So no, as, as Mikhail, I don't, I don't think that it's gonna make much difference now, any kind of decision now. The silence about this internal affair, Spanish yeah, internal affair. Exactly. We Mikhail. have to remember that Europe has two international organizations, as, as we all know, the Council of Europe, which is an older organization based on uh, human rights, uh, democratic rights, uh, fair elections, and so on. And on the other hand, the European Union, which was founded as uh, a, a commercial economic uh, area agreement. So those two have uh, courts of law that um, carry out the treaties of each of the two institutions. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, um, a significant place, you know, right slap in the middle uh, between the two historical warring partners. Uh, uh, and we have to be so grateful to the European Union and the Council of Europe that there has been no war between France and Germany here for over 75 years. I mean, that, that is unheard of. Um, and on the other hand, in another bordering country, we have the Luxembourg European Court of Justice, uh, which uh, I, I agree um, doesn't have uh, much uh, enough punch either. Um, I agree with Raphael. I mean, there are important issues of European policy, particularly in this period when uh, Europe is trying to rebuild uh, a more modern Europe after the pan. Uh, pandemic. Uh, well, I mean, that's a bargaining chip that can be used uh, with any, any uh, country that doesn't uh, respect, for instance, the right of national minorities, which incidentally is the main difference between Poland and Hungary. Poland and Hungary is a battle for power, but it's not a battle against any national minority. Uh, Spain is, and I think that deserves the attention of not only both courts, but also the institutions of both, uh, of both organizations. And finally, the Council of Europe came out very strongly against Spain quite recently. And uh, uh, sort of headlines in Spain were, you know, the Council of Europe uh, uh, agrees with uh, Spain's policies. Bullshit, sorry, um, nonsense. Uh, it, it certainly did not. So there again is another example of falsely portraying uh, what is going on in the outside world, which makes the average Spaniard e even less uh, in touch with, uh, with reality. But we'll see whether reality catches up with the Spanish authorities as well. Yes, in, in this sense, a viewer commented that in the case of the cruel and violent closure of the Basque newspaper, Egoncaria, even though the Spanish court finally cleared the paper and the convicted people, uh, no compensation has been paid until this moment. So um, he asks you about remarks on this, maybe about taking too long. Is it still justice? 
Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I've mentioned. Is that it's really troubling and worrisome that the courts take so many years to 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 decide on pretty much anything. Uh, and also, even though both in the case of Egon Caria and Egin, uh, the European Court said that Spain was in the wrong, there's also the issue that the persecution remains now against Gara, because Gara is considered by the Spanish justice as an heir of yes. both Egin and Egon Caria, and they had to pay hefty fines because they were considered the heirs, the heirs of, of, of those newspapers. It makes absolutely no sense. And obviously, probably there's probably going to be a lawsuit. I'm not sure if they they they, they have started yet. Uh, the lawyers of Gara, but it's probably going to have a complaint on European courts. It's going to take another 10, 20, 30 years. European is going to say it was absurd to ask them to pay the fines of older newspapers and etc. And that's just going to be it. That's one of the one of the biggest issues that also Spain counts on the slow the slow pace of European institutions, European courts to keep pushing and pushing against Basques and Catalans. That's one of the issues. Like uh, imagine, uh, imagine how, how many years it's gonna take uh, for the case of the Catalan political prisoners to reach the courts and for a decision to be made. And Spain is counting on keeping pressure in Catalonia for, for the Catalans to drop uh, the pledge for independence before the European courts do anything. That's the point. Yeah, I agree. Can, can we just, again, as an example, remember that a judge was condemned for not uh, investigating tortures in the Basque country uh, uh, by the European Court of Human Rights, the Council of Europe uh, Court. Uh, that judge is now a, a minister in the government, you know, so it really had no effect on his. Uh, career, political or otherwise. Um, and this, again, this example setting of people who have been condemned as criminals actually carrying on their daily life uh, thereafter is because they are, you know, they're on our side rather than the other side. Uh, that is uh, very distressing and, and a bad sign. You can see a lot more um, xenophobic um, homophobic uh, violence now than there was three years ago because people get arrested and, and, sort of, and let out of the back door of a police station. So, you know, there's, there's almost complete impunity in things which uh, can develop, blossom, grow up and poison society as a whole, in my view. Okay. There is a lot to do. Thank you very much to both of you, Rafael and Mikel. Um, before we close our event, we would like to make, or I would like to make some closing remarks in order to summarize for our audience and also for the paper we are going, going uh, to send to the commission. So the use of an external actor, oh, we already heard like George, So it's the use of uh, these external actors by increasingly authoritarian governments um, are made in order to justify their actions against political opposition. And this is on the rise in order to manipulate public and audiences. I think we can uh, agree on that. So, and also that uh, what we are now witnessing in Spain against Catalonia is a, a uh, sample of the growing process of authoritarian police state that has been going on in Poland and Hungary and other countries around the world. We have been talking about uh, Brazil and about Trump and the US. So fake news and disinformation paves the way to the suppression of dissent and is aimed at attacking political opponents. Twisting the law to remove political opposition in a less unpopular way than physically suppressing political rivals. So it's um, it's uh, changing, but um, at the end, it seems to me with um, same results, not for the person, but uh, for the problem. So in content such as Spain, 
false police reports are being elaborated to prosecute Catalan politicians, reports which very often have been given credit by Spanish media to criminalize Catalan democratic pro-independence movement. This is also a big problem right now since um, the media are always uh, repeating and taking this stories and taking it for granted and suggesting this um, um, the situation that they are guilty. So most of the EU media tend to be balanced, tend to be balanced in giving a perspective on the conflict between Catalonia and Spain, even if they do not sympathize with the idea of Catalan independence. So we also do um, realize like this uh, in this way in other countries, not only in Brussels, in the EU, but um, this doesn't mean that this media sympathize with the idea of Catalan independence. It's only like trying to be balanced. And despite of that fact that there is freedom of media in Spain, um, what when it comes to Catalonia, most Spanish media, both in the left and the right, uh, share the same criminal criminalizing narrative against Catalans, which creates uh, hatred and dehumanization as it happened against the Basque people years ago. This negative narrative also aims at convincing the audience that repressive measures are legitimate. So, and I think um, this um, conference today has shown us that there is a lot to do, a lot to denunciate, a lot to tell and uh, to try to keep fighting for uh, the real freedom of media for the media so that we get back to more information and to less disinformation and uh, we would like to thank you very much Rafael and Miguel for your contributions for joining us today and um, we would like to thank the audience for the questions and for joining us also and thank you very much for, to everyone have a nice evening and see you next time. Thank you very much as well. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>